the Collective Whisper Podcast with Simon King. Hello and welcome to this week's show. And today we have a really interesting guest. But before we get to that guest, I just want to remind you guys to please follow and subscribe wherever you see the like button or the follow button. And we hope you're enjoying the content so far and the guests. And we'll try and get as many great guests for you as you can. I'm enjoying you being here and I hope you're enjoying listening to the show. Okay, so moving on to this week's guest. Today I'd like to welcome Mike Sutton. So Mike Sutton is the Deputy Director of Flight Operations at DRAC in Europe. Mike Sooty Sutton is a former wing commander in the Royal Air Force, RAF. Sooty led the first squadron of Eurofighter Typhoon FGR-4s into combat in the war against ISIS in 2015. An an RAF fighter pilot for 18 years, he flew the Jaguar strike jet before becoming an instructor on the first RAF Typhoon multi-role attack squadron. The Wilshire-born pilot led one squadron, a legendary squadron which fought with distinction during the First World War, Battle of Britain and the Falklands War. Taking command of the squadron represented the pinnacle of Mr. Sutton's career as a fighter pilot. He flew Typhoon fighter jets at nearly twice the speed of sound in some of the most dangerous and fiercely contested airspace in the world. He also conducted a live scramble in response to potential terrorist hijacking and served in operations Afghanistan and Iraq. During his time as a tactics instructor, he conducted a live scramble in response to a potential terrorist hijacking and served in operations Afghanistan, Iraq, Iraq. He left the RF as a wing commander aged 39 and now flies commercially providing operational readiness training for the UK Armed Forces. He was awarded the OBE in 2017 and currently has a book out called Typhoon. Typhoon is the first ever inside account of Operation Shader, the British participation in the war against ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Welcome to the show, Mike Sutton. How are you? Hi, Simon. I'm good. Thanks very much for having me. You're welcome. And it's a pleasure to have you on the show. You know, um, I try to broaden the variety of guests I have on the show. And and I've kind of been looking at like pilots and, you know, people flying the skies. And I've been thinking, That's, I want to get a pilot on. I want to get somebody who has that kind of experience. So you're the perfect guest. Well, that's great. So I'm the first fighter pilot on the show. That's a great honor. You're the first fighter pilot in the show. I, I, I've contacted one or two uh, and, you know, people are so busy. I think probably you will find as well after your career in the military, you know, there's lots to do and there's so many things you can sink your teeth into, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I was in the RF for 18 years and I left three years ago and I had a fantastic time in the military. Uh, it, was, it was awesome to go and fly jets, see the world meet some fantastic people. Um, and then when you leave, you realize that actually there's a whole bright, you know, multicolored world out there and you can get involved in all sorts of different things. Yes. And, you know, we're, we're going to talk about your book. Uh, Mike currently has a book out called Typhoon at the moment. We're going to get into that book a little deeper later on. But uh, the book is released right now, isn't it? Yeah, thanks very much for the plug. Um, yeah, I, I, I read a, a book called Typhoon, which is... Uh, it's a flying memoir, really, about fi- flying fighter jets and how you get into that world. It's an insight into a hi- into a hidden world. And I uh, wrote it when I left the RAF during lockdown, and everyone, myself and everyone else in the country, had a lot of time on their hands. And I finally got around to writing up some old uh, diaries that I kept. I was in charge of the first typhoons that deployed out to counter ISIS back in 2015 in Iraq and Syria. It was a pretty unusual time, uh, and uh, we were all watching and aware of the ISIS atrocities across the globe and across Europe. And I was in charge of the High Readiness Typhoon Squadron in the UK. Uh, and whilst watching the news and watching all this get getting played out, we suddenly got a phone call one day saying, you, you might have to go and get involved. And a few days later, off we went, first light. Uh, and then very, very quickly into the most kinetic, extraordinary air support missions over Iraq and Syria, and I guess we can talk about that a bit later. But it was so unusual and so high tempo uh, that I thought I'd write a diary because my, my memory is terrible, like a calendar. So uh, during lockdown, I finally got around to writing it up. And, and it's kind of with a bit of encouragement from friends and families, it grew from there. I, I think when I got back, one of the things that 
when you come back from a conflict, one of the things that, that people ask who went there was, well, what was it like? And what were you thinking? And how did you feel? And I tried to address all those questions in the book. I've tried to immerse the reader in this hidden world. So it's not a technical book about flying. There's a bit of that in there, but it's really about what happened, what we were thinking, what it's like to be flying at Mach 1, what it's like to be supporting the troops on the ground, what you're worried about, what you're, what's going through your mind before you drop a weapon, what you talk about on the ground with the other pilots, all of that sort of stuff to really um, expose that world to, uh, to someone who's never experienced it. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. I'm kind of one of these people, you know, I have a really inquisitive mind and, you know, I've always had this type of inquisitive mind and maybe now it's caught up with me and I'm doing the perfect thing where I'm a podcast host and asking questions because I love asking questions. And I'm one of those people who look at like someone like a fighter pilot and, you know, you see the you see their day to day activities and the training, all that. But then I always have these deeper questions like what did they do in this situation or, you know, when they're when they're lining up for an attack and, you know, they're strafing with the machine gun. Have they, you know, all sorts of questions, you know. But so I think this is really fascinating that, you know, you have a book like this, which goes into a lot of detail and, and shows the mind of somebody in those, you know, frenetic and you know as you said kinetic and hostile situations where everything moves so fast yeah uh, and, and i've really tried to expose it and it it's not a macho book it, it's it's really talking about not just the the operation that that, that we got into and that, and that i was sort of leading and the people i was responsible for but really how you get selected what the training's like um, what it's like in the centrifuge when you get thrown around at 9G and you're learning how to counter all of that so you don't black out. Um, a few close calls during flying training when I almost crashed into a hillside in a Jaguar at low level um, and then getting onto Typhoon when it was the first multi-role uh, new fighter aircraft. And that first day, walking up to this huge 50 million pound aircraft and what's going through your mind? Um, I did a quick reaction alert sc uh, scramble against a potential terrorist um, hijacking that happened in about 2000, that was 2009. So I write a bit about that. And then this build up to the operation and the tension on the squadron and what everyone was thinking. Um, a lot of the, the, the missions that we did, we didn't know what we were going to do before we got out there. So we were told you're going to uh, go and support troops somewhere in Iraq or Syria. And Often you're in the cockpit, it's a single seat aeroplane, there's no one there, you're parceled in, wearing all your kit, you've got a little pistol strapped to your chest in case you have to eject. It's night, the rain's lashing down against the canopy and you've got eight hours in this jet. You know you're gonna fly over it to Iraq, you know you're gonna fly over to Syria, you know you're gonna be involved in some action, but you don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and I've tried to just bring the reader into that world and just it, it expose you know, your thoughts, your fears, what you're thinking about all the time, sort of minute by minute, um, and also the relationships with um, with friends and peers and what they're thinking, and and some of the sort of reflections of it all as well. Yeah, I mean that's so fascinating. So let's go back a little bit. Obviously, you know when you were younger and you started your fascination. So you grew up in Wiltshire, didn't you? And you, I I, I know just from researching you that obviously you kind of got the bug when you were in your you know middle teens and. You you uh, you started dreaming of being a pilot after being on a flight and so on. Tell us a little about that when the bug bit yeah, you. Yeah, I had a really lovely but very normal kind of upbringing um, and very happy childhood. I was a bit of a, I think probably a bit of a kind of geeky kid at school and that I played a lot of sports and I was into that, um, but I wasn't a huge academic or, or, or anything. But you know, see aircraft flying around. And I'm ashamed to say now I'm 43, this before the internet. So you couldn't uh, research stuff particularly easily. My family didn't have any uh, friends really that were in the Air Force. And so the idea of or, or commercial pilots, and so the idea of um, becoming a, a, a pilot or even a fast jet pilot was just something that I just didn't think I could do. Um, but yeah, after a flight, uh, back in the day when you could go and look up uh, in the cockpit of, air, of an airliner. I went up there with my brother and we saw these things. We were flying over France. And I remember just looking down. You could see the lights of Paris. You could see over the, the channel. And just thought, I've really got to try and give this a go. Um, 
And that's when I really tried to, to look at applying. Um, and a sort of friend of a friend of a friend of my parents was in the Air Force and they got, they got this guy over who went to the pub and had a beer and he talked to me about it. And then, uh, then I applied to the RAF after that. Uh, and didn't get in actually the first time around, so I had to reapply a second time. And, and I, luckily, I went to university and learned to fly there and reapplied then, and, and got in the second time. Okay, so so explain that process to us. You know, when you go to you know the the testing center, obviously where they screen the candidates and so on. What kind of candidates are they looking for? So uh, obviously, you have to be what sixteen, seventeen to apply. You've got to be a, a minimum age, and I forget what it is. It's I think probably seventeen, and there's a maximum age as well because the flying training takes a, a few years to get get through. So I think it's twenty six. It changes every now and again, but uh, between those two ages, and then the selection process is you go up to a place called RAF Cranwell in Lincolnshire, kind of middle of the country. Uh, and it's the home, actually, it's the home of the RAF. And the RAF was the first ever Air Force in the world. Uh, so it's got a really nice bit of history there. And you go to this grand base uh, and you get chucked in a little, um, uh, a tiny little room, which is a sort of taste of things to, to come if you get in uh, for accommodation. And then you get three days of selection. And the selection varies in, in the sort of tests that they're doing. They kick off with a load of aptitude tests. So you walk into a room, you're all facing this computer screen and you sit there for about three or four hours and they assess your hand-eye coordination. Uh, you do some mental arithmetic. Um, they've got a little joystick in front of you and you've got to do some uh, some sort of tests on the screen where you can kind of follow a dot and look at shapes and work out which way around they are and you know some things like that. And these, these things go on for three or four hours. Uh, you then have some maths tests. You then have a medical. Um, you then have an interview. And then after about a day and a half, you all sit in this room, um, the group of you, I think there are about 30 of us there, and they read out a list of names. And I remember there being about 12 or 15 names uh, read out by this corporal. And he said, follow me through into this room. And everyone's sitting there working out whether they're the guys that passed or they're the guys that go home halfway through. But we never saw them again. So I managed to make it through to the, the next phase of the selection. Uh, which is into a big hangar for a load of group exercises where you're working as a team trying to do um, little sort of scenarios that give you some planks and barrels and ropes and you've you've got to display your leadership potential but also be a, a team player. Um, those two roles kind of at, at odds with each other. Um, and then some more, some more tests uh, and exercises. And the whole thing goes on for about three days. And then you get a letter through the post about a week later, in my case, saying I hadn't got in. Right. So so after that, you know, first time when you you I won't say fail, but you didn't make the grade, we'll say. But how long did it take you then before you reapplied or did you do it straight away? Well, I think uh, a lot of people get the chance um, or a lot of people don't get in first time round. And so they they encourage you to have another go. And I think they quite like the tenacity of someone who who tries. And I think it's a real lesson there, actually, for youngsters that quite often things don't work out the first time round. And that's fine. You know, quite, it's just an opportunity to go again and do it a bit better. Uh, I went off to university and uh, studied philosophy, which is a little bit random, but I'm pretty hopeless at maths and things like that. So I studied that yeah. and I joined a thing called the University Air Squadron, uh, which was uh, an organization um, run by the Air Force. And it would teach university um, students how to fly. And if they had a bit of potential, maybe try and get them into the RAF. So I joined that. And had a fantastic time, met some really like-minded people. It was a really social organization. The Friday nights were always really good. And then we did some flying as well. And then about 18 months later, I reapplied. Um, a little bit older. I knew the system a little bit more. I'd done a little bit of flying. And I guess I gave a better account of myself the second time around. Okay. And I was going to you know, say there as well. Because obviously for lots of young people who want to become pilots, it's a pretty costly endeavor. I mean, to get your wings and any type of plane and to put in all of those, you know, you see on TV shows, uh, he has a thousand hours, he has 200 hours. So you have to put in the time. But in doing so as a civilian, you, you have to pay a lot and, you know, be in a flying club. But when you were in that aviation club in university, were, were the lessons from the Air Force subsidized or was it free? Was it a scholarship? Kind yeah, of it was completely free. So they had a, a selection process as well. 
Um, but, you know, they were looking for more of a broad range of people, so it wasn't quite as strict. They weren't offering jobs at the end of it. But I think there were about 20 of us or so, 25 of us that joined Southampton that year, which is where I went to university. And these things are dotted around the country. There's around about 15 of them. So wherever you are, um, there's one kind of close enough, if, if that's your thing. And they're a great organization because they do teach you how to fly for free. And the hours that you uh, accrue there, you can use towards your private pilot's license. Um, so some people did it, decided a career in the military wasn't for them. But they got a bit of flying training, then they could they could take that and maybe pursue it as a hobby or use it as their first run on the, on the ladder to a commercial license. One of my great friends I talk about in the book, um, he was a fantastic pilot at university. He was sponsored by the Air Force, so he was due to uh, to join. But but while he was there, his eyesight deteriorated a bit, and you've got to have really good eyesight to get in, or you did at the time. Um, and his job was pulled at the last minute, so he left. But with the hours and experience he would got there, he then got a cadetship with Aer Lingus. And so he moved over to Dublin and has had a fantastic career with them with them since. That's that's really interesting, isn't it? The co- You mentioned the cost. Um, it's since 2001, since since 9-11, the whole airline industry has changed beyond recognition. And the way that they used to recruit really was the big airlines like Aer Lingus and British Airways and all these others would uh, select people, select the people that they wanted, then train them up and pay for the training. Uh, but after the crash of 9-11, in terms of um, you know, people stopping flying and you know, the whole world changed, the model changed, predominantly led by Ryanair, actually, and uh, decided to start recruit people and, and not do the cadetships and to get them to pay for their own training. And this has now sort of permeated throughout the industry. Um, and all the airlines have twigged now that, that really pilots love flying and they want to do it. So they'll normally try and pay themselves through their training. And it's horrendously expensive. It costs the cheapest is probably about £50,000. And you know, most expensive, probably £120,000, depending on your school. And it's awful. Um, it puts huge pressure on people. And, and most of them end up taking great big loans out and, and trying to pay them back like a second mortgage when they started earning. Wow. It's it's like, you know, when you hear people in the US paying huge um, bills and loans for training to be a doctor and all of this thing. But as you said, it's changed now for pilots and they're ending up with maybe a career, but taking a few years to pay back that loan to get that career. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's uh, the, the model's completely changed. It used to just be essentially an apprenticeship, you know, in a profession, you go and you'd be trained up, they'd pay you less while you were training, and then you were good to go. But now people, yeah, most civilians now start with big debts, and then they've got to work that through, and it takes people 10, 15 years to kind of clear it. So it's a shame, it's not a positive thing for the industry. When you finished in university, how many hours would you say you had accrued? I think I'd phone around about 100 hours. And the Air Force training is broken okay. down into uh, three steps. So you do your first phase of training, flying training, which is called elementary flying training, and that's around about 100 hours. Um, in my case, it was then off to officer training and six months of square bashing around and bivvying out and a bit of marching, leadership stuff, all, all, that, sort of, all that sort of thing. But then where I really wanted to be was back in the cockpit. And uh, we were streamed after that into the different types of aircraft we could fly, either fast jets or multi-engines or helicopters. Uh, and I fortunately went the fast jet route, and that was another year of training then uh, up in Yorkshire, flying a thing called the Takano, which looks a bit, it's since been retired, but it looks a little bit like a Spitfire. It's got a big propeller, a nice sort of elliptical wing on it. Uh, and then if you pass that course, it's off to fly the Hawk, which is the, the jet that the Red Arrows fly. And I was really lucky because I, I went out to Canada to fly that for a year. Uh, that's called the Advanced Fast Jet Training. So did that, got through the tactical stuff, and then they put you onto a frontline jet. And I was put onto the Jaguar, which is the thing I always wanted to fly, a low-level strike attack jet. And that took about another nine months of training So um, before I hit my first squadron. So it's so around about four, four and a half years of sort of full-time training before they let you loose in one of these things for real. The, the thing that I've always wondered... You know, on whether it be whether it be on movies, whether it be on TV or whether it be on reality or documentary shows that when you train to be a pilot in the RAF, 
do you actually, is there a point, let's say, where you're training in helicopters and planes, and then you say, okay, it's planes for me, or they decide, and no more helicopters, or do you get your helicopter's license as well? Yeah, they don't train you in anything that you don't need to be trained to fly, because it all just boils down to cost. So the, Air, the Royal Air Force, and I think it's the same across nearly all the Air Forces, uh, they will just pick the people that they think are best suited to a particular you know, type of operation. And um, then they, they push them in that direction. So the guys that started flying helicopters uh, after the officer training phase, uh, they had a full career in helicopters. Some people do, do cross, right. it's called a crossover. Maybe they, they do that for five or six years and they might want to go and try fixed wing or bigger uh, transport airplanes, big airplanes. And that does happen. But most of the time people get on a type big aircraft fighters or helicopters and they'll kind of stay on that and, and, and progress their career on that type of, um, of fleet. Okay. Yeah, because you, you kind of imagine, obviously, with pilots, you know, especially with fighter pilots, that because it's such a high precision and high training, you imagine then that a lot of these pilots could fly anything. But, you know, maybe it's the case that they say, okay, can you fly a helicopter? And they'd say, well, I did some training in the beginning, but then I, I, I didn't after that. So it's not, they can probably fly any type of plane, but obviously when you get a, a helicopter pilot who advances and this is his sole purpose, there's a different level, isn't it? Yeah, most pilots could fly most other planes, um, but the, the type of flying that you do... Uh, it's just slightly different uh, between them all. And so I think what they try to do is get an idea of where someone's, because uh, it's not just a flying skill, but I think there's an approach and a character and, uh, and they try and get the right fit for the right, uh, you know, the right fleet, if that makes sense. Yes, I understand. And even though you're after 10 years of flying, uh, you know, a fast jet, you could probably jump in a Hercules transport plane, you know, have a bit of training and you better do it you can cross over, but they, they think it's more efficient and it probably is more efficient to kind of get people set and then, and then, and then get them very skilled in that area. I guess a bit like, you know, you use the, the medical profession analogy, you know, doctors become specialists in certain areas, don't they? Then they generally sort of stay in that field. Right, right. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, of course, it makes total sense. But I suppose, um, like, that's one of those questions that I suppose people in the outside world are always wondering, how trained do you become? Or is it completely specialist in one direction? And that answers the question. That's kind of a thing you imagine is more cost effective. You know, you're not going to train uh, Commander X to be a helicopter pilot captain and uh, a typhoon captain as well. It's too much time and too much money, that's isn't it? That's exactly right. Yeah. And just like uh, in any business, uh, the military tries to keep costs down. Now, it's, it's an expensive game flying aeroplanes, um, and they're pricey to build, they're pricey to fly, they use a lot of fuel, so they try to keep the cost down as much as they can while still retaining that yes. uh, tactical excellence that you, that you strive for. And they use a lot of simulators as well for that. So there's an awful lot of sy synthetic training, it's called, that's a technical term, but simulators really... Uh, so that you can practice a lot of these procedures and then before you get into the air. Yeah. And you mentioned there, um, obviously, going around at 9Gs, you know, and, and uh, what do you call it again? What's the name of the the, the machine? Oh, the centrifuge. Yeah. Yeah, the centrifuge. So, yeah. So the thing that I trained in that's since been replaced was in uh, the Bond film Moonraker back in the 60s or whatever. Oh, okay, I remember. But it's essentially a capsule room that you got parceled into at the end of a, basically a scaffolding arm. And this thing would just swing around. It's on YouTube. You, you can watch these things. And it just swings around this, uh, this uh, circular room. And as it goes faster and faster, it kind of tilts at the end. So it's like a, you know, the most extreme fairground ride you could possibly imagine. And it gets you up to 9G. And to put that in sort of some sort of context, I guess, um, you... You're, when you're wearing on your flying kit, um, your your head would normally, your average human head weighs about five g, uh, five kilograms. When you put a flying helmet on and a mask and all the rest of it, probably another couple of kilograms. So your head weighs not five kilograms, weighs seven kilograms. And then when you're pulling nine g, your head now weighs nine times that amount. So your head now weighs sixty three kilograms. 
and that's just your head. So if you can imagine your whole the weight of your body now uh, times by nine, and just the kind of pressure that that puts on you, you can't you couldn't raise if you had your hand on your lap. There's no way you could kind of raise your arm up against that. You're just forced back into the seat. Um, and the the real risk there is that your blood is just pushed away uh, down towards your feet. And the problem with that is that your blood pressure in your head, uh, your brain would be very low. And that, and that's a real risk of a thing called G-lock, G-induced loss of consciousness, where or blackout, where you hear this thing, very occasionally pilots will gray out or blackout, and it just means they've lost consciousness. Um, and sadly, over the years, jets have been lost because the, 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 the pilots blacked out and the planes crashed. So they train you um, about that and, and how to try to counter the effect of that in the centrifuge and then in your early training. Yeah, and it, it's quite interesting. I, I, it's funny, the other day I was driving with my kids and we were, they, some, they mentioned something about gravity and we were talking about it. And I said, we were driving the car and as we went around the roundabout, you know, and they were tilting over, I said to them, guys, you know, like in the Formula One cars, they go around maybe 200 kilometers around an hour around the corner. So they have extreme G-force and they were like, what's G-force? And I said, well, look, I'm not an expert, but it's the gravitational pull on your body at extreme forces and so on. And they were like, what, what? And I was like, just, you know, your body weighs more. And, and my boy was like, and so if it weighs more, I mean, if, if your head weighs more and this stuff, can your neck break? So that's a question, actually, that I was thinking, I don't know, because the, the stress is on your whole body. But if, as you said, if your neck was weighing that much with the helmet and everything on, uh, can is there a danger to your neck of like or or your your skeletal frame like in that um, movements? Yeah, my first question to you is how fast are you driving your car for your kids? To- <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Nothing like that. I wasn't doing nine G. Yeah, no, you're right, <laughs> and, it, and it's it is a real issue, and so most of the guys try to keep themselves pretty fit and and go down to the gym, um, and I know a, a really close friend of mine uh, crooked his neck um, when he was doing flying training where he was turning really hard one way to the left and he reversed the turn and his neck just kind of snapped back. And it didn't break, but it just caused a really horrible muscle injury uh, that has kind of stayed with him. And, and he never made it through fast jet training as a result because he, he had some physio for a few months, but then wow. when he called the G again, uh, his neck immediately had this kind of searing pain in it and he just couldn't do it. So he... Uh, had to stop and go and fly transport airplanes. So, yeah, it is a big factor. Um, wow. It, putting G's, a, a, it's a strange thing. You get used to it. You, you, we used to sometimes take passengers for, um, for rides in the Typhoon, and I'd never pull very much G. There were actually limits on what you could do, but you just pull a little bit. And people, would, you'd land having, having flown this thing around for an hour and turned it upside down a couple of times, and people would peel themselves out the back of the airplane, just go, oh, my goodness, I need a coffee. But in the front, because you're doing it every day, you, you, you're just kind of used to it. So it's funny what you physiologically get used to doing, but absolutely, there's a real risk of neck yes. injury, um, particularly. But also, if, you, if you're twisting your body around, trying to look behind the aircraft when you pull G, it can be really uncomfortable. Uh, so it is something that it's, it's not fun. It's something that you, you just kind of get used to. You get match fit for. And the more you do it, funnily enough, actually, the easier it gets. Yeah, and I also read there that a strange thing for you, you suffer from vertigo, or you did, did in the past, no? Yeah, no, I did. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I still do, yeah. I'm like, I'm awful with heights. So uh, I'm okay in an aircraft, which is kind of lucky, given my job. But if I'm anywhere high, like uh, I was on the holiday with my girlfriend a few months ago, and we had a little balcony outside the hotel room, and she went out and leaned over. I couldn't get anywhere near the edge. I'd stay about three feet back and kind of hold myself back. So, yeah, if I'd passed all the aptitude tests at Cranwell and then they'd told me to go and look outside the balcony, I'd probably have failed it at that point. So, yeah, I don't really like the kites very much. Do you think you don't you don't feel it the same way because it's kind of like, you know, when you're in a car, you don't really feel like you could be moving very fast but you don't feel it so when you're in a plane and even when you look out and you're thirty thousand feet up you don't feel like it's a height do you it's really strange i think because you're strapped in and you're in a in a canopy i don't feel it at all no i I don't get any vertigo i think it's the risk of uh 
for me, it's a really weird feeling, isn't it? It's the risk of falling. Um, so yeah, any yeah. sort of height going up. A, like I hate glass floors. You see them sometimes, don't you? There's no way I'd ever stand on a yes, glass yes, floor yes. or a glass bridge or anything crazy. No, like no. I don't like that. Uh, but no, when I'm in, the, in an aircraft. Yeah. How then, if when you're in a plane and you do like a barrel roll or something, a maneuver where you have to turn. Now, I know maybe you don't do them that often, but where you have to turn the plane upside down or something, especially you can imagine, obviously, with the Red Devils or any of these stunt planes. Would you suffer from vertigo and that's when you're upside down? No, luckily not. I think it's I think it's all psychological, isn't it? And when you're strapped in and yeah. you're strapped into an ejection seat, I always felt, felt pretty safe. So I never had an issue with it when I was actually in the air, luckily. Brilliant. I wanted to ask you there... A very interesting. I was reading some excerpts from your book actually today uh, from the Daily Mail. And um, what was really interesting for me was when you were talking about the training and when you had that part of the training where you were uh, hunted down in, in the, the um, by the Marines and you had to simulate being captured by the enemy and you had a pistol in, in the worst case scenario. But that was quite interesting because, you know, if you watch these shows, SES, Who Dares, you know, the reality shows that are on TV now and they're hunting down the can the recruits and so on. But in your scenario, if a fighter pilot is, you know, taken out or he's, you know, hit by something but survives or he ejects um, and you have that kind of situation. One thing I thought was really interesting, what you said was you knew in the middle of that situation that you could go down to the pub on a Friday night or there'd be a party after the training. So psychologically, when you're doing the training, you know that it's not 100% real compared to the real thing, no? Yeah, 100%. And who doesn't like a party in Newquay after a few days on Bodmin Moor, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the training, yes, we, yes. we did survival training in, in kind of basic survival. I remember doing a week of training without food up in North Yorkshire. It was January and it was sort of north degrees and drizzly and it was unpleasant. Uh, and then I did a winter survival course in, when I was over in Canada and that was that got pretty cold. You could take a glass of water and just chuck it into the air and it just turn into ice crystals and, and fall down. So that was chilly. Um, yeah. And then when I got onto the front line, they make you do a course, uh, an escape and evasion um, kind of course, which is more tactically focused. And that was a few couple of days of training and then three or four days outside where you don't sleep. They get you to do navigation exercises at night so you don't sleep. They give you lectures in the day. The whole thing really just to kind of get you tired. And then on the last night, uh, you do a, um, a navigation thing where you've got to get from um, A to B over about 10 kilometers and you know the Marines are out after you and they, they're trying to get you to move tactically through rivers and keeping a low profile but it's a turkey shoot really because you've got a load of really tired pilots being hunted by the Royal Marines with all their night vision equipment so everyone gets caught and then um, put into a uh, um, it's it's called the monkey house, but you get put into a building where they put you in stress positions. And I had about a day, about 20 hours of that, where they just expose you to some unpleasant things and and, 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 and you, you get a bit of training. But I think reading, reading experiences of people who've been shot down for real and what they've gone through, I think the training can only ever go so far. And all their experiences are, are really different and, and really challenging. And you touched on the risk that, that we faced out there and the enemy did have surface to air missiles and small arms and um, when we first went out the whole of the region was under control of ISIS and the thought of, of bailing out into that situation was a, was a harrowing one I and mean, we had uh, combat search and rescue um, forces on standby but there was no guarantee that they'd have, they would have been there so we had some procedures the main coping mechanism really was to not think about it too much, uh, learn the procedures and, um, and and know what you're going to do if the worst happens, but really just focus on the job in hand and focus on helping soldiers, which is precisely why we were there. 
and just concentrating on that. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. So yeah, let's move on to obviously when, when you're talking about the book, but the, the you know the main focus of the book, ty- the typhoon, the aircraft. So you know the, the typhoon is a a, a, um, a Eurofighter, and and we we've seen the Eurofighter on our uh, TV screens for years because obviously. There was a joint collaboration, you know, in Europe between the French and the English and all the different nations. So you said there you trained up on the Jaguar and then you switched over to the Typhoon. Was it a completely different animal as as regards the plane when you first took the controls of that and you thought, wow, let's see what this baby can do? Yeah, I guess it was probably like getting out of a Ford Capri and, and, and getting into a Formula One car. Uh, the Jaguar was a great aeroplane. Wow. It would go fast. It would do 500 knots, but it wasn't very maneuverable, and it was pretty old. It was full of uh, old steam-driven instruments that had been flying really since the 70s. So it was a great force to be on. It had taken part in, in Gulf War One. It had a huge operational background to it, but it was getting long in the tooth by the time I joined it. And then I was really lucky to get onto the first Typhoon Squadron. So the Jag, the the MOD actually closed, the, the RF closed the Jaguar force, and um, a few of us got onto the Typhoon, which was great. So I was on that first Typhoon squadron, and it was a generational leap. It was a, a multi-role aeroplane, which means that it can it can do reconnaissance, it can do air-to-air, uh, long-range um, missile shooting, it can do quick direction alert, which is scrambling to intercept uh, aircraft, it can do air-to-ground, which means that it can drop weapons, it can support the army and it's really agile so it could fly almost 